Minister of the Faith and Global Engagement Initiative here at the University of Hong Kong. And that music was Louis Armstrong singing What a Wonderful World. And I thought I'd play it to you because I wanted you to feel good about the world before the lecture. You know, the colors of the rainbows are pretty in the sky. Uh, friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? Really saying, I love you. So this is global feel-good music. In fact, I think it'd be nice to shake hands with one another, actually, and, um, you know, I feel a it, it, it's okay to feel good, right, at home for you. So maybe you should turn around and shake each other's hands and say, how do you do? Hello, hello. <laughs> Of course, of course, yes, yes. Okay, that's enough of the yeah. Okay, so one world, one love, one humanity. Have you, have you ever uh, noticed that the tune for What a Wonderful World is almost exactly the same as Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is one reason why there's a sense of nostalgia in this song. It's an old man looking at the world with the naive and innocent eyes of a child. He's really singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And there are lots of feel-good songs uh, like this, including John Lennon's Imagine, where they sing of a wonderful world in this kind of na naive and nostalgic way, as if the world they were imagining is already in the past. A kind of a was and never will be world. This world isn't for real. It just feels good. It's a kind of warm, fuzzy escape. Now, there are many religions in the world as well that believe in a wonderful world with humanity living in harmony. But their belief in this unity is not a was and never will be, but a now and ever shall be kind of world. There's a kind of militancy to this vision, a commitment to the now and the future. So it doesn't just feel good, it wants to do good. And there's another process as well that is creating one world and one humanity, a technological and social economic process, globalization. And globalization is making the idea of one world and one humanity a reality. But does it feel good? Or does it feel kind of empty, just a process that does not necessarily really result in rainbow-colored faces of people shaking hands and saying, how do you do, and I love you, and me too, and all that kind of stuff. Now, what happens when faith and globalization meet? The world is becoming one before our eyes, globalization, but then our religious beliefs in one humanity are exclusive truth claims in each religion. So the globalization process by bringing people of different faiths together can result in a clash where the different claims to unity can result in disunity. Not rainbow-colored people shaking hands, but shaking fists. Not saying, how do you do, but who the hell are you? <laughs> so with uh, globalization and the resurgence of religion in the 21st century, if you have faith, you are part of the challenge of globalization, and perhaps also a solution. And in the Faith and Global Engagement Initiative, we believe that this is one of the most pressing issues that we must engage with. We just can't sit around and sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, right? What feels good needs to become good. So we have to engage with the issue of faiths in a global order. And this is why we've invited the leading theologian on this subject to Hong Kong U the Henry B. Wright Professor of Theology at Yale, Professor Miroslav Volf. Of his 15 books, many deal with the tensions that result in a world in which different beliefs are contested in public, sometimes violently, particularly in the Christian-Muslim context. And these books include the award-winning Exclusion and Embrace, I'm sure many of you know that book, to the new book he's currently working on with Tony Blair, Faith and Globalization. Now we dragged him all the way from the East Coast of America just to give this talk. So please give Professor Ball a massively warm welcome to keep him awake as he speaks to us on faith in a global order. Okay. 
Well, massive thanks to all of you for coming out, and uh, thank you for Professor Daniel Chua, and also to Louis Armstrong, to be welcomed to Hong Kong by Louis Armstrong himself. Uh, what, a, what a treat. Uh, result also of globalization, of a globalized world. I trust, uh, you, you can trust me, I'll keep awake. Uh, I may need not be always coherent, but I'll be awake. <laughs> In fact, as I was thinking about uh, giving this lecture and answering this question that was posed to me, I thought, well, uh, I know a very simple answer to it, and it would make my lecture very short. The answer is yes. <laughs> curse, blessing, or curse, yes. <laughs> if you understand properly what blessing here means, if you understand what curse means, if you understand what yes means, <laughs> uh, if you understand what globalization means, uh, the answer is yes. And if I would put it this way, actually it wouldn't be completely empty. Right? I would be saying that religion isn't just curse. It's also a blessing. And I would be then saying something different than the great critics of faith have said through the century. I think of Nietzsche, for instance, uh, one of the most uh, vigorous and I think insightful critics of religion who thought that religion is one massive curse on humanity and therefore deserves to be cursed. Or I think somebody of a lesser stature who uh, belongs in that same tradition, Christopher Hitchens and his book, God is Not Great, which is subtitled, How Religion Poisons Everything. Now when I say yes, religion blessing or curse, I say religion isn't simply a curse. Faiths aren't simply a curse. But when I say yes, I also say that religions aren't simply a blessing. Defenders of religions uh, say that religion is blessing. Generally, they don't say that all religions are blessing. Generally, they say, my religion is a blessing, but yours is a curse. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Chua has already mentioned kind of the tensions that arise when world faiths make universal claims in a world that is uh, very closely intertwined. When one says our religion is blessing and you, the other says your religion is a curse and then conflicts ensue. Or some might even say adherents of a particular faith, not that their faith in general is a blessing, but they would say our authentic faith is a blessing. There's a difference, difference between lived faith and what we might describe as authentic faith. And I think almost nobody would say that the lived faith has been, any of the lived faiths, has been unquestioned blessing. It has it had, had its own history in which it functioned as a curse. We can name examples in just about all faiths. I can easily rattle down examples from all faiths. Which is then to say that at the lived level, at the level of how people live faith, faiths are both a blessing and a curse. Now the most interesting question is not whether faiths are blessing or a curse, but when faiths are blessing and when faiths are cursed. What are the conditions under which faiths become one or the other? Now, to, to answer that question, I think we need to talk a little bit about what faiths are. And you might think that everybody knows what religion is, right? And we don't need to talk about it. And yet, for those of you who are students of uh, religion, uh, do religious studies, our sociologists, you know that the very concept of religion, very concept of faith, I'm using these two terms interchangeably, uh, and even my use of them in interchangeable way would be contested by many, right? 
So um, religion itself, you know, some people would say soccer is a religion or shopping is a religion. Others would say Marxism is a religion, but they would say Buddhism and Hinduism aren't. Scholars don't quite agree. Luckily for you, I don't have to enter into this debate right now because I'm concerned here actually not with religion in general, but with major world faiths. I myself am a, am a Christian, but in this lecture I'm looking from a Christian standpoint onto faiths uh, and how they engage the processes of globalization. You'll see my own Christian faith shining, shining through because most of my examples will come from the Christian faith. But let me give you some examples, some, some features, in particular six features of world religions. They're really important for us to understand how religion, how faiths go wrong and how they can go right. So here are these features of world faiths and I'll sketch them by contrasting them with what one may describe local faiths. Some scholars distinguish between uh, primary religions and secondary religions or between local religions and global uh, religions or world religions. And I'll give you this contrast between primary and secondary. And by secondary, I mean world faiths, I mean Christianity, Judaism, uh, Islam, Buddhism, and so forth, right? <coughs> okay, so six features. Uh, secondary religions are addressed to individuals. In primary religions, devotion to gods is closely tied to social life of a group, to a society, to a linguistic group. As distinct from that, secondary relig religions address individuals. They pull them out of the nexus in which they find themselves and insert them into what one might describe a transcultural, transnational community, individual and world community. That's why they're called world faiths. Second feature, religions just because of that um, secondary religion, form distinct cultural systems. In primary religions, religion and culture are practically identical. Religion is ineradically described in institutions, in linguistic and cultural conditions of a given society. Secondary religions are more or less autonomous systems. They can kind of separate themselves from a particular culture, which means they can look at that particular culture with a critical eye. I'll come to that a little bit later. So they're distinct cultural systems. Three, something that Professor Chua has already mentioned, uh, secondary religion or world religions generally make universal claims. Local religions are local, and they make local claims. It's about my God. It's about my well-being or well-being of my group, but not about the whole world. Secondary religions, they make universal claims. Universal claim to what is true, not just here for me, but what is true everywhere. What is just, not just for us, but what is just also everywhere. They give a, a diagnosis of human predicament. In Christian faith, that's sinfulness of humanity. And they give a solution to that diagnose, di diagnosis, salvation through Jesus Christ, or something like that. But that's a feature of secondary religions. Connected with that is fourth feature that I want to mention. Is it fourth or fifth? No, third. third. Fourth. That's right. I can't count. I can give a lecture at this time, but I can't count. <laughs> <coughs> and that is that they all have what I want to describe by using terminology of Friedrich Nietzsche, two worlds account of reality. Now, primary religions are what some people call cosmotheistic. That means that gods and spirits are kind of fused with society. They're not extra mundane realities. They're part and parcel of society. They're not absent from there. In fact, the whole society is suffused with religious powers. 
but they're part and parcel of the whole thing. Whereas secondary religions kind of split reality into two, into two spheres, transcendental sphere and mundane sphere. In the Christian faith, this is utterly different from the world, and the world, which is not God, the two are connected, but two are clearly and radically distinct. That's a kind of two worlds account of reality. Those of you who are here students of Nietzsche, you know that that's one of the main thrusts of Nietzsche's critique, uh, not just of Christianity, but also of Platonism, of Judaism, uh, this idea that there are these two worlds, right? Which then implies a kind of quarrel with reality. Um, another feature of world faiths is that they have a concept of human well-being, human flourishing, that goes beyond our natural, ordinary human goods. Primary religions are concerned primarily about four things. Health, wealth, longevity, and fertility. Give me those things, right, richly supplied in wide varieties, I'm going to be very happy. <laughs> That's what it means to flourish as a human being. Now, in secondary religion, there's a sense that there's somehow these four natural ends and goals that we seek are meaningless in themselves, that they're light. That our true good comes in connecting ourselves to the transcendent source of all reality. Flourishing is more than just achieving health, wealth, longevity, and fertility. Flourishing can be achieved even sometimes while suffering and being deprived like dying on the cross. In all fo forms of world religions, there is such an emphasis on flourishing beyond our natural goods. And finally, final feature of uh, world faiths is transformation of worldly realities. If you have two worlds, the world above wants to shape the world here below, or the world here below ought to align itself with a world transcendent world. All world faiths claim this, which means that unlike primary religions, which, of which is characteristic kind of assent to life, acceptance of life as life is lived. For the world religions, world religions have what some people have described describe a quarrel with life. The kind of life isn't as it ought to be. That's also connected with the idea that you're separate from this system in which you find yourself, and therefore you can have a critical assessment of it. Whole tradition of Hebrew prophets is predicated on this. Society isn't simply affirmed, but is called into question. It is called into question in the light of God's precepts for that society. Now, this can have ascetical forms and prophetic forms. Ascetical forms seek to control the body and its desires uh, in the light of or adjust the body and its desires to the unseen order. Prophetic forms seek to adjust the society as a whole to this. And this, too, is a feature of world faiths. Now, one of the key central things, and with this I will finish my account of the world faiths. Um, one of the central things in world faiths is the precise nature of the relationship between the two worlds. Remember the two worlds I mentioned, transcendent and uh, mundane? Now, how are these two related? Are they just in opposition to one another? Or, do world faiths embrace and affirm the world, but give primacy to the transcendent? Now, I can give you a long lecture just on that. <laughs> uh, I'll spare you of that. I could give you examples of that, which I will do. Uh, I could give many, many different examples. One example would be how Jesus relates to ordinary life and the transcendent, uh, transcendent life. You could explicate that 
in the famous story of Martha and Mary. You know, the, in the Christian tradition, that's the whole reflection about relationship between active life and contemplative life. Or I could go to Greek philosophers. Socrates would be a great example, right? The relationship between his commitment to the unseen order and justice that it entails and his willingness to sacrifice his own life in order to proclaim, assert, affirm the truth of human uh, existence to the good of human beings. I think what I will do, though, is I will use the example that my, you might find surprising. And that's the example of the great sufferer of all ages by the name of Job. You familiar with the story of Job? comes from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible. The story is set up in this way. There was this man and who was rich and powerful and who was at the same time blameless and upright, who feared God and turned from evil. In fact, he was rich and powerful just because God has blessed the work of his hands and also has put a hedge around Job. I, I thought it was very interesting that, that you have to have a hedge, right? Blessing doesn't help you very much if you don't have a hedge, right? It kind of dissipates. <laughs> you can have as much, but it's like pouring something into, into a, a sack with a hole, right? It never gets filled. So you've got to have a hedge and then you've got to have a blessing, and then you get to be great, right? This is exactly what happened with Job. Now, that's the setting. Now, the drama begins with a dispute. And the dispute is between Satan and God. Now, Satan, who is kind of an incarnation of destructive suspicion, Satan claims that Job is like an adherent of a primary religion. He fears God. Why? Because God made him such a great man. God gave him blessing. Well, of course, that's why he fears God. He serves God in order to get wealth, health, longevity, and fertility. Now, God disputes that. God thinks that Job has an integrity, and that his devotion is genuine to God. Now, in the rest of the story of the book, uh, if you haven't read it recently, do read it. And if you start, uh, but, but watch. If you start reading it, or as I have done, listening to it as I was jogging, you know the jogging with Job? <laughs> <laughs> I did it. I must have heard Job 50 times, I would start my, my jogging, put my earbuds in, turn on, um, and I would hear this mid-Atlantic accent recite to me the book uh, of Job. Because I was so fascinated, taken by this, by this story. So the, the rest of the story is really about Job's reaction to the test to which God and Satan put him. And this test, really, was the only way in which the dispute could be settled between them. Does Job love God just because he loves God, or does Job love God because God has given him all these things? So stripped then of his, all his belonging, bereft of all of his children, inflicted by sores, Job neither curses God nor gives up on his integrity. Instead, he contends with God, tells God that his situation is unjust, that he was unjustly treated this way. And God grants it to him, right? It's a test. <laughs> and his agonizing struggle with God is rooted in his unwavering commitment to God. 
and also to the principle of justice, to his own integrity. In the end, as we know, God and Job prove Satan to have been wrong. Job served God for nothing. Remember at the beginning of the story, I didn't mention it to you, but this is the challenge of Satan to, to God. Does Job serve you for nothing? He doesn't serve you for nothing. Now at the end of the story, you have a demonstration. Job serves God for nothing, for no other benefit than simply that it is the right thing for a human being to be attached to the source of their being, to the transcendent one. Now, it's not that when you serve God for nothing, you actually get nothing. <laughs> That's also the result of that story, right? Remember how the story ends? Job gets twice what he has had before. So it's not that God's service of God stands in contrast to wealth, fertility, health, longevity. To the contrary, Job gets many more children. Job gets many more possessions. Job gets many more and better sons and daughters, <laughs> right? But the question was, what has primacy? Around what does human life revolve? Is it around health, wealth, prosperity, and longevity? Or does it revolve around God? Now, in all primary religions, Christian faith certainly, Judaism certainly, this is what you have. You have order of priorities. God comes first. Then comes our ordinary life. Right. Now, do I have a, I do have a watch here, okay. <laughs> now that's, that's a bit about faith. Now, when we know this about faith, now I want to ask the question, under what conditions do faiths become a curse? And under what conditions are, there, are they a blessing? And before I do that, I have to give you a little footnote and little digression. And that digression concerns kind of the nature of the lived faith. And I want to build on something that um, sociologists, whom you all should read, by the name of David Martin has written on the question. You're familiar with, uh, with his work? If you're studying sociology, I'm sure you are. Have you read about his theory of secularization? But even those who know him quite well haven't read one little book that he's written, and that is Does Christianity Cause War? <laughs> That's the title of the book. From this book, I take uh, an, a, a kind of account of religion that he has, of faith that he has. And basically he says, Faith isn't a simply one monolithic thing, and certainly isn't one monolithic thing over the centuries. Rather, a faith has what you might call a repertoire of motifs. And depending on the situation in which you find yourself, or faith finds itself, Faith draws, people of a particular faith draw certain motifs out of their faith and construct a certain version of that faith. It's like orchestra. You're like orchestra and you go to a particular place and you think, now oh, what, what's going to play well there? And then you pull out from your repertoire and construct a kind of a concert that you have. Something similar, he says, takes place with all different faiths, including Christian faith. Now, some of these concerts are quite fine, <laughs> and some of them may be a bit problematic. And so the question becomes, when do these religious concerts <laughs> become problematic? When does faith turn to be, in his case, this was the question he was trying to answer, when does it turn violent? And his answer to this was, and this is my first point about how faith turns 
to be a curse. When faith is closely tied with a given society, its institutions and its aspirations, then the adherence of that faith reconfigure faith in the service of that particular society and regime in which they find themselves. And we see that throughout Christian history, we see that throughout history of all other faiths. Come close to political power. And if you come close to political power, you are going to reconfigure your faith, and faith is more likely to serve as a source of violence. That's one of the great issues that we're facing today in the globalized world. Faiths as sources of violence. My argument would be that faith becomes a source of violence when it identifies too closely with a particular society culture. Notice what faith has then done, world faith has done when it does that. It has turned itself into primary religion. You recall the feature of primary religions that I mentioned to you. One of the features of the primary religions is that they are inextricably tied with particular locale. But they're tied with locale because they don't make universal claims. They're religions of this particular group of people. World faiths make universal claims. If you tie them too close to a particular group, then you get religiously sanctioned imperialism, violence, jingoism, whatever you want to name. And then people end up serving not so much the God, transcendent God of all people, but they draw that one God of all people, claim them for themselves, and then try to impose that on others. Fates then inevitably clash, and they're not source of blessing. They end up being the source of strife. That's one way in which faith turns uh, into a curse. Now, the other way is almost the uh, opposite way in, in certain ways, and it concerns not so much politics, but it, it concerns economy. It concerns what makes things that make our lives to be wealthy, healthy, uh, long, and, uh, and, and blessed with, with many, many children. Kind of economy regulates these kinds of aspects. Uh, and when faith now becomes world faith, becomes a servant of our economic goals, it also turns into a curse. Notice again what has happened. Faith, world faith, has become like the primary religion, like paganism. Okay. become like a primary religion because the function of primary religion is just to do that, to make sure that there's rain so that your crops can grow, to make sure that there is a blessing, to make sure that you can have children, and so forth. Right. They're all about how to make your ordinary goals of life come true. World faiths are not about that primarily. They include that, but that's not their primary goal. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. Not seek first to become wealthy, healthy, and last wise. <laughs> then too, in these kinds of settings, religion turns into a curse. Now, let me say a few words about uh, religion as a blessing, and then we'll have some time for question and answer. Now, when, does, when is faith a blessing in the context of a globalized world? I think it's kind of inverse of when it becomes a curse. When faith doesn't identify with a particular group, but when faith keeps its concern for humanity, for human beings as human beings, when it functions in its universality. This is almost paradoxical. Some people think if faith functions in its universality, it's going to become violent. If faith functions in universality, what it will do, it will apply golden rule to every and any situation. It will do what Jesus has commanded his followers to do. In everything you do, in everything you do, 
do unto others as you wish them to do unto you. That's universalism of faiths too. Universalism of faiths isn't just claiming that faith is true. Universalism is also treating every human beings being as equal as the image of God, and therefore demanding exactly the same respect as any other human being. That too is inscribed in the world faith. Certainly, it is inscribed in the Christian faith. <laughs> I want to spend a bit more time on the question of the relationship between Christian faith and kind of blessing in conjunction with the questions of economy. And the reason why I want to do that is because I think that the contemporary globalization is that this uh, interdependencies, interconnectivities that have been created in the world um, are primarily driven by market forces. A globalization, I think, is primarily a market phenomenon. And what globalization does, a kind of way of life in which it kind of carries in its wings, is a way of life that, just as market does, is oriented primarily to the plane of ordinary human life. Globalization is about health, <laughs> wealth, longevity, fertility maybe not so much, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's equivalent. <laughs> about ordinary ends of human flourishing. And I think where faiths and globalization often come into productive tension is because, as you will recall, faiths are about ends that are transcended to, transcended to the original ordinary ends of human beings. And the reason why faiths emphasize that our ends are larger than these ordinary ends of human flourishing is because of two predicaments that make the search for ordinary goods a kind of futile. And I want to elaborate a bit on this and with this end my lecture. And the two predicaments in which we find ourselves is the predicament of our insatiability and the predicament of human mortality. Now, you may think that insatiability is a very much modern phenomenon, but it isn't. Those of you who are readers of the Bible, uh, you have probably read, and if you haven't, you should, Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes, a book, a uh, wisdom book in the Old Testament, uh, addresses these issues of insatiability and mortality. Here's a line for Ecclesiastes. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, they continue to flow. And then it adds, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, or the ear filled with hearing. We're an ocean, every one of us. There is never an end in the possibility of our satiation. Many philosophers uh, since that time have elaborated on these themes. You can read it in Kant, you can read it in Hegel, you can read it many, in many others as well. Our desires are infinite. Like a notion, we are insatiable. And our insatiability gives rise to ever-flowing river of our work, and play, it gives to that <coughs> river an aura of futility. Now, the second predicament is our mortality. In fact, it's not so much mortality itself. It's the awareness of mortality, our awareness of mortality. Here's again a quote from Ecclesiastes. There's no enduring remembrance of the wise or of fools, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How can the wise die just like fools? 
all human labor, great and small, is chasing after the wind. And then the Ecclesiastes, traditionally it said that Solomon, the great King Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes. Then he gives examples of what it is that is chasing after the wind. I made great works. I built houses, I planted vineyards for myself, I made myself gardens and parks, I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees, I made myself a pool from which to, to water the forest of growing trees, I bought male and female slaves and slaves who were born in my house, I also had great possessions, great herds and flocks, and there he goes. Right? I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces, I got singers, both men and women, and delights of the flesh and many concubines. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And then he concludes, then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had spent in doing it and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. After all has been done, all has been gained, there wasn't anything <laughs> to be gained. Nothing was gained. Why? Because of our mortality, because of our insatiability, and because of our mortality. Now, when we think about global world order, when we think about globalization, if globalization doesn't take into account these two fundamental predicaments of human existence, it will be marked by utter futility. And this is what some people also argue. I want to give you that to you in the, with the example of two, two examples of two images. And one is the squirrel wheel. You familiar with the squirrel wheel? You put the squirrel in and it walks and walks and faster it walks, the faster it stays in the same place. Right? In his book, classic book, Affluent, The Affluent Society, John Kenneth Galbraith compared the struggle of modern societies to satisfy their wants with the efforts of a squirrel to keep abreast of the wheel that is pulled by its own efforts. No matter how much we produce, I would also say no matter how well we distribute, economic means can never meet our economic needs. Our economic needs can never be met by economic means alone, just because of our insatiability just because of our mortality. See, the proper object of human insatiability aren't material goods. They create a futility. Proper object of our infinite desires is the infinite God. Sometimes I think that we, uh, you know, critics of religion often say that uh, religion is a kind of projection of our desires onto God. I think that we are in, uh, engaged in a kind of inverse projection. Our need for God, we project on our material goods. Right? So they become for us the source of salvation. And they end up being the source of utility. One more image and then I will be done. Now globalization kind of means progress, right? Supposed to be progress. And actually the pace of change is extraordinary and in many areas of our lives, progress is absolutely extraordinary. Technological progress, um, progress in medical sciences and so forth. Uh, it's, it's miracles are being worked in front of our, in front of our eyes. Right? But death takes away everything that globalization gives. Between two world wars, 
Uh, there's a famous uh, German-Jewish philosopher by the name of Walter Benjamin. And he reflected about progress in uh, a kind of short and dense uh, work entitled Thesis on the Philosophy of History. And in particular, in one of these theses, I think it was number nine, if I'm not mistaken, he was inspired by Paul Clay's painting of, uh, called Angelus Nobs, the angel of history. And here's, here's his description of this. That's the description of this angel of history. His eyes are staring. His mouth is open. His wings are spread. His face is turned toward the past, where we perceive a chain of events. He sees one large catastrophe that keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been shattered. But the storm is blowing from the paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. You know, I always think of it this way, you know. All of us flap our wings, right? <laughs> Longing for the lost paradise. Fueled by our insatiability. And those wings of our desire, they get whipped up into this mighty storm that propels us forward. That storm of our insatiable desires fuels globalization as well. And what does this storm leave its in, if it, in its trail? Not what we have now, but what's in its trail? Wreckage piled upon wreckage, smashed pieces everywhere, dead, writes Benjamin. Mm, now you will say, well, wait a second, Benjamin. What have you been uh, drinking? <laughs> uh, some kind of depressant, <laughs> right? Uh, isn't it true that we have temples, cathedrals, Great monument, glorious music. That, isn't it true that all of this remains as well? The whole wisdom of the age is cultural memory, amazing stuff that we are discovering and from which we are benefiting all the time. And the response is they do remain. These things do remain, but they remain for a while. Without transcendent goal, everything will eventually pile into debris. Globalization, burdened by injustice of centuries on which its success feeds, and kind of piling debris in its wake. That globalization that is both unjust and it's inconsequential. Unjust in that it reaps where it has not sown. We reap where we haven't sown. And it's inconsequential in that it builds sandcastles only for the breakers of time to destroy them. Globalization, we as part of globalization processes, we need redemption. Redemption from the lost time. Redemption that would give us abiding significance. Faith can do that. Christian faith claims to be able to do just that. It points to the one who awakens the dead, renders justice for the victims of time irreversibly lost. And then with God, in God's own infinity, preserves everything that is true and good and beautiful. Thank you very much.
you very much for that very clear and uh, very wise lecture. We have some time now for questions. Um, we want to leave quite a bit of time so that we can do this. Uh, Miroslav. Uh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> pleasure. And um, I think there are three rules that you must keep, however. I can't let my own mic to work. I think you can hear me. Um, the first is this. Please. This is correct. Now, it is not, um, it is not a must that a secondary religion be globalized. It could be a local set of believers going, um, moving to the direction <coughs> of towards secondary religion, even though they are a small group of people in a localized um, location doing their own things, but they can still be secondary religion, if I understand it correctly. Yes, uh, I think the feature of uh, l secondary religion as opposed to primary is not kind of the amount of space they occupy, but a kind of vision that they have. Universal claims uh, addressing human beings, qua human beings, rather than members of a particular uh, tribe. Uh, it's this universality that makes them world faiths rather than local faiths. Um, and you can give example, just about all the world faiths were actually what you described that they were, right? Buddhism was such, uh, um, Christianity was such, Judaism in many ways, Islam was uh, such, a small band of people gathered around founder, in the case of Christianity, 12 disciples gathered around Jesus even before, then when there weren't even 12 of them, right? Uh, it's a global faith. Socrates was the same, if you want to in involve Socrates. So, so the feature of it is universality of its message and being addressed to human beings, qua human beings, rather than members of particular community. And I'm going to have a follow-up question that bothers me. Now, if universality is what that makes the secondary religion, then why would it so surely more and more people would like to join in and share the same beliefs. So there is a tendency for this local set of beliefs to go into a bigger location and sort of go globalizing. But yet, the features of globalization will, you, uh, will, will be kind of full of a lot of mundane considerations like money and social connections love, that sort of things. So how are there checkpoints for this secondary religion to keep their universality without um, being downgrading into a primary religion? Do you have any uh, suggestion or? Yeah, that's, that's a, if, if I hear you rightly, I think that that's a very important question in a sense. How do you, um, so super, uh, let's assume that universal uh, glo world religions, uh, or for some of you, for myself, that Christian faith is a true faith. Um, let's assume that that's right. But then uh, there are temptations that that faith has, as I've indicated in my lecture, to turn itself in one way or the other into a kind of local faith, uh, to be a provincial faith rather than universal, to address um, other people from perspective of me as belonging to a particular group. Uh, war breaks out between the country where I was born, Croatia, and the neighboring country where I uh, grew up, and suddenly all little Croats think that God is on their side against the, the Serbs, and all little Serbs think that God is on their side against the, against the Croats. It's the same God, right? But each of them has claimed God for themselves, and the claim to have God on their side fuels their, their conflict. So one of the central questions that we are facing is how to prevent uh, world faiths from becoming local uh, faiths. Many examples in the world. And I, I think that, that is the key struggle for, the, for, for Christianity, certainly key struggles for, uh, for Islam. I think actually that here globalization might help us a bit, uh, which may be a strange thing to, to say, but um, often faiths are culturally specific, and in modern world, nation-specific, because nations are relatively homogenous units. But if you have intermingled people and pluralistic social environments, 
if you have migration of, of people, they bring their own faith with them. Often what happens with migration, you have people from different parts of the globe of the same faith coming to the same place and then realizing, wait, wait a second, our faith is really not about the culture. This is a matter of culture and this is a matter of faith and we can come together on a matter of faith even though in the matters of culture we often disagree. But that creates a certain kind of disembedding between faith and specific cultures. Both in the faith that comes, if there are plurality of faiths that come, and also within the society, society at large. And I think that this social pluralism of globalization is actually good for faith. Now that's a controversial claim, I, uh, I realize. But it can help faiths free them from the captivity to particular local instantiation. Now, faiths, I think, were the original globalizers. The faith's first formulation of the global vision was done by faiths. But just these world faiths that I have mentioned, some people talk about them as axial religions, axial breakthroughs and so forth, right? Um, <laughs> And I think you have almost like a global idea that was formulated and then faiths became captive always to the local situation. Globalization is creating a world where such captivities become more and more difficult. They're more problematic, right? But more also difficult and therefore less likely to succeed so that you see actually that faiths that are thriving are much more portable faiths and, and faiths are being transformed to become much more portable. Good example would be Islam in this particular case, if Olivier Roy uh, in his book Globalized Islam is right. But that's a story for another lecture, maybe. Another question. A question, uh, the person here, and before. Do you, uh, there are two mics, so if you have another question, we can send that mic to another person. There's a question over there as well. Um, so, picking up the response you gave there, where you said that, that um, the globalization of faiths is improving, is resisting to becoming local faiths again. Um, to inject a sort of a, a, a sort of realist perspective and, and taking um, Judaism as an example, if, if a Jew stands up and says, "Well, God tells me that He really is my God, and that my local faith is correct," and and you can't, you know, it's politically correct to globalize my faith and say, "Well, everyone should be allowed to be a Jew." But if God says these are my people, then whatever you think of globaliza globalization, a local faith is the correct one because God says so. Uh, how, how would that fit in? Well, well the, there are faiths, right? There are still, or that continue to be, um, kind of local, local faiths. Right? Many such faiths. They, the, in the world, they're not only world faiths, they're also local faiths continue to be. I haven't made comments about local <laughs> faiths, right? Um, and it would be a, it's, it's a kind of particular story of the relationship between globalization and the local faiths. If I see rightly, Judaism is, it has features, it's kind of its original globalizer, right? A monotheist faith, but has feature also of a local faith. A local faith in the sense that there's a particular relationship of God to Jewish people and they kind of orchestrate that relationship uh, in, in a way that includes humanity as a whole, uh, covenant with Noah uh, as opposed to covenant of God with, uh, with uh, uh, at Sinai uh, becomes the modality of Judaism including the whole of humanity because obviously it worships the single God. Uh, but yet, uh, yet realize and keep the special, special status. Now, Christianity uh, has perceived, rightly or wrongly, that there is a tension between the local commitment of God to a particular people and the universality of faith and has basically expanded uh, one of the, you, you may call, uh, Apostle Paul's innovation. Is, uh, is precisely that. Uh, in order to expand what was faith limited to particular group of people and give it a form of universality that is uh, more encompassing, you might say. Um, whatever judgments one, one makes uh, about this, I mean, it's, it's true that Judaism is a particular kind of universal faith. Um, I think each of the faiths, and that's, that's certainly the, the case, uh, my judgment is, you know, 
states have been around before globalization came around. And uh, if globalization falters, faiths are still going to stay around. And from the perspective of a person of faith, globalization is a little, little, little piece of the history of the story of God's relationship with humanity that spans millennia. Uh, indeed, that goes from eternity to eternity. That's how faiths think. Faiths don't think in matters of years. Uh, they think in matters of uh, eons, right? And in that sense, I think the primary obligation of faith is always to the faith itself. That's indeed the, the feature of all world religions that, well, you should obey God rather than <laughs> human beings and God is above. That's the transcendent connection that we have and that'll create um, often difficulties. It opens up possibilities, but it creates difficulties sometimes. Uh, Professor, you just mentioned that uh, social pluralism and uh, globalization, in the end, they might lead to uh, one global faith, one global religion. No, no. Or no, that's not what I said. <laughs> but uh, just, to, just to make sure, I don't believe that at all, one global religion. But go ahead. <laughs> but, uh, as I understood, uh, it might be a good thing when the religions, they drop their cultural component and uh, go to the, some kind of universal principles, uh, good for uh, all types of societies, all types of cultures, all types of people. Is, is it correct? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, but I would say that each of the, of the global faiths, uh, it's happening in each of the global faiths. For instance, it's happening in Islam. Globalized Islam is increasingly detached from the particularities of, of a culture and it's become kind of spirituality. It's become a, a either, either kind of set of beliefs that is transportable across the, across the boundaries. Um, I, but it doesn't mean that it has merged and become one faith with some other faith. I think uh, global faiths, world faiths, will remain as distinct faiths. I think it's a good thing that they remain, in a sense, as a, as a, as a faith. Claims to truth that they possess are partly overlapping, partly clashing, and I think those are very productive discussions that faiths can have. I don't see a reduction of faiths onto one global uh, faith in the works. I, you know, I, I see a lot of faiths being, uh, world faiths being alive. Uh, if, you, if you look at the statistics, uh, you have faiths, uh, Christianity, you have Buddhism, you have uh, Islam consistently growing rather than diminishing in numbers. Uh, from perspective of a particular faith, from perspective of my faith, I believe that Christ is the key to history, right? That, that's why I'm a Christian, right? Uh, a, a Muslim wouldn't share that belief. Uh, I think that the likelihood that we're going to merge into one faith are near zero. Uh, I have no aspiration to that, but I think it's a very good thing for us to ask ourselves what might be Muslim and Christian common tasks in the context of globalization. And I think common task, I think it is to remind people that there is purpose to life greater than health, wealth, fertility, and, uh, and longevity. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> you know, to me, you're present uh, in the sound. Uh, <laughs> your, 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 your actual yeah, anyway. flesh, your incarnation doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I can connect with you. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. And my question is, um, you mentioned that two things standing in the way of globalization, or two things global globalization cannot deal with, is our mortality and uh, our insatiability. And my question is, isn't there, um, if we see, glo uh, if we see re religion or faiths uh, throughout history as very often the driver of globalization itself, mm -hmm. isn't there an insatiability in faiths itself, in many of our religions, especially the global ones? 
that could be could be a hindering to these these states and to the threat. Uh, well, there there is a um, there is a kind of insatiability uh, to faiths uh, themselves, um, but actually the, the faiths themselves uh, once once you are once uh, so, so take a missionary faith, take Christianity. I take it that's what you're uh, referring to, right? T take Christianity as a missionary faith. Uh, I think structurally Christian faith is a missionary faith, right? And it's connected with just its account of what true, what good is, the place of Christ in its, in its account as a source of, uh, of, of human, human beings, as a creator, and the goal of history. There's just no way to get out of the universality, therefore also of missional thrust of the Christian faith, therefore also of what you would describe as a form of insatiability. But it's really not insatiability. We, you know, at, at the most, Christian faith wants the world, right? <laughs> That's not insatiable, right? That's just, <laughs> you know, spread through the, through the whole globe. The same is true of Islam, the same may be true of other, other faiths, uh, faiths as well. But there's a, there's a different kind of insatiability in, uh, in globalization. It's not just that it wants the world spread, markets to spread. Or it's kind of intensive insatiability also. That is to say, um, every nine months, a new iPhone comes out, whether you need a new iPhone or not. right? And this is just one example of gazillions of examples that one can give so that it's kind of predicated on what Mont might describe in Hegel's terms on false infinity. It's almost like a fata morgana, right? You, you always are reaching, but you never achieve. And the structural element of it is that you cannot achieve satisfaction, right? It's not that, uh -huh, that there's a promise of satisfaction and then there's fulfillment. Well, there's fulfillment for a second or two. And then the rate of obsolescence is designed so that your desire would be generated anew, right? That is the insatiability. That's the ocean that gets to be filled and then uh, th that never gets to be filled, although the rivers flow into it, and then ends up being emptied once you die, right? Then there's nothing <laughs> there anymore. And that's the structural problem, I think, with orientation of human beings on to the flat plane of ordinary life. That's the problem with human insatiability. And I think the correlate of that is divine infinity. I, I think the statement by, uh, by most famous statement by Augustine from one of the most famous religious books of all time, Confessions, our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. So that there's this insatiability which has its own proper Fulfillment, right? Fulfillment and also generation, depending whether you follow Gregory of Nyssa or, or Augustine, whether you think of uh, everlasting life or eternal life, but that's a theological discussion. <laughs> um, yes, I have uh, two questions. I think uh, one of the uh, driving forces in uh, the trend of globalization is uh, scientific discoveries and uh, technological development. And uh, my question is, that you see there is a trend of uh, reconciliation between uh, science and religion, whether in fact uh, there will be you know, a kind of a um, common kind of a interaction among different religions, not to really you know, moving towards one single religion in the world, but then there will be a lot of exchange of ideas and there will be a lot of commonalities due to the uh, advancement in internet communication technology. That's it. There is a lot more common ground um, you know, among different uh, faiths. And also, will there be uh, a kind of a trend of reconciliation between scientific beliefs and religious beliefs? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Big questions, all of uh, you pose appropriate to the big themes that we are discussing. Um, uh, I, I'm hopeful that religions, that faiths, would discover their commonalities. I think there is interest 
in everybody who is interested in truth to locate the truth that he or she believes in somebody else's beliefs. Because that's a good thing. <laughs> if there's truth in Islam, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Right? Some people think that the more different you are, the better, the better it is. I don't think that's the case. Because the closer there, the, another faith is to the Christian faith, I think the better on the whole it is. I am therefore, any believer, is interested in commonalities, interested in differences as well, right? Because differences give a particular uh, specificity to, to the faith. But commonalities are also important. I, but I don't see, the, I, I see maybe interest in commonalities rising, but I don't see the commonalities kind of obliterating the, the differences. Sometimes I feel that internet actually goes the other way around. Right? It, it kind of accentuates and gives precedence to uh, kind of in a faceless encounters to the extreme uh, positions. Um, if I, if I um, you know, I'm, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and people react sometimes and uh, y you see some of the things that I, that I write, I mean extremes react to it often. And if you take this to be reality, and some people do, then internet becomes the form of reality, then you have a misperception of reality and you have a constant uh, heightening of, of differences that's happening just in the virtue of the, this particular uh, medium. Right? At least that's one theory. I know there are multiplicities of theories about how internet functions in this, in this way. In terms of science and, and religion, or technology and, uh, and religion, um, I, I think there are important debates to be had. But I think that two of them are actually not competitors for the same territory. Uh, I think a lot of the debates between science and religion has occurred because religion was understood primarily to offer explanations of reality and modes of manipulating reality, miracle, magic, and so forth. Right? And often it was then seen as primarily concerned with the ordinary plane of existence. <laughs> you explain how, how life functions and you provide people with means to achieve certain ends that they have. One is science, the other is technology. Right? But that misses the most important part of faiths, <laughs> the transcendent dimension of faiths and the purposes of human existence. Faiths are about goals, about orientations that we have. And I think it's much easier to achieve uh, a proper marriage, if you want, of science and technology than is often uh, taken to be the case. Because they don't have exactly the same domains. There are going to be debates that are going on because there's an explanatory part of religions. There is an interventionist part of religion. But that's not at the heart of faith. Well, at the heart of faith, it's not a question. So, so you, can, you can put globalization in terms of yeah. science and technology. If you take technologies to include technologies of organizing peoples and managing people, right? If you take all this as a technology, then you can say globalization is one large thing about science and uh, and. Uh, uh, and, and, and technology. But then some people say, oh, oh, religion is then a competitor to this, right? So now the question is, who's going to explain reality better and who's going to deliver greater goods in terms of social benefit? If you put things in those terms, you have set things completely wrongly because you've missed the most important function of religion, which is to take you out of the domain that you've just described and connect you with the transcendence. Science can do that by the very nature of the technology can do that. And I think uh, religion is here to frame the science and technology, not to be in a crazy competition with it. I think there's time for maybe one or two more questions. questions. There was a uh, question at the back there, and then. Uh, Question. You have a mic already. Okay, and you have a mic already, so you have to ask this question after that. So yes. Um, yes, Professor Wolf. Um, just now you mentioned that uh, faith is not a monolithic image. Uh, there we and go. Yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of it. 
I see you now. No, it's okay. Um, you mentioned that paint is not a monolithic image, rather in different time periods, different motifs from the web for an hour right, to meet the uh, challenges of the time or the needs of the time. Uh, this reminds me of uh, Hans Kuhn's characterization of the different pragmatic uh, shift in uh, Christendom. Now, in your assessment, what are the motifs being drawn out in the period uh, that, that we have inherited? Uh, a period of, um, let's say, the post Shoah world, the post September 11 world. What are the motifs of Christianity that is being drawn out that are different from those in previous times? Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I, d I don't see this um, kind of sequence of motifs as a kind of succession of global paradigms, right? So, so that you have a kind of one paradigm follows another and it's a kind of worldwide uh, or across the faith kind of paradigm, which is sometimes the impression one gets from uh, Kung's work. I, I see those, those alternative ways of living faith at place, uh, at work, in variety of periods. I mean, for instance, you can, you can look at, you can observe a relationship between faith and political power. It's very different at the time of foundation and the first centuries to Constantine and after, but it doesn't mean that one paradigm has shifted, changed, the, taken completely over. Um, many uh, small groups have remained numerically as strong as the Christian church was at the, at the beginning centuries throughout the Constantinian period that have an alternative account of how faith relates to political power, critical of political power and so forth. So you had kind of configuration of motifs into a particular way of seeing present at the same time. And I would say also that in today's world, you've got also multiplicity, sometimes crisscrossing uh, configurations of faith intersecting with one another and involved in kind of vigorous debates. Um, you've got free market Christians, you've got socialist Christians, you've got uh, human rights Christians, and you've got duties uh, Christians, uh, and, and so forth. And sometimes they come together, sometimes they, they go, go apart, but they comprise a, a, a kind of discrete group of folks that organizes the elements of faith around those. And uh, I think we need to have a kind of discerning judgments. And uh, often those would be, um, you couldn't say one is wrong and the other is right. Though sometimes those judgments are also be called and Christian faith, just like other faiths, are one large kind of debate of traditions kind of faith centered around hopefully the core uh, convictions of the, uh, of the faith, but debating uh, very important issues of uh, our faith and our life. Protestantism and Catholicism are two paradigms, right? One hasn't succeeded the other. Uh, they're parallel. <laughs> So um, your, the distinction between primary and secondary religion is very helpful um, to me. But I also observe that it is so difficult to keep a religion either on the primary level or on the secondary level. So if I claim that my religion is true, it contains the universal truth, then I will also want to relate it to my real life. And at the same time, because I believe that it is true, there is a natural tendency for me to bring this truth to other people. And hence, the involvement of possibly politics and force in spreading my belief. This can be seen in the Christian history, in the Muslim history, in the, um, basically in all the other um, world religions. So I want to ask you for your comment on um, politics. Is there a need to separate politics from religion, in whatever religion that we are talking about? Or if there is a need to do that, um, is there any guidelines that you will advise people in power so that religion will not intervene into politics in an unnecessary way. Mm. <laughs> now, I, I, know, I know that this question has a kind of Hong Kong uh, undertone <laughs> to, to, to it. Uh, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't know all the, all the streams and, uh, and, uh, and swirling uh, uh, areas of, of waters uh, in, in Hong Kong to be able to <laughs> Nav navigate uh, well these waters. You will you will know that much more. 
I mean, I, I distinguish between involvement in politics, uh, engagement or prophetic engagement, and identification with political projects. Right? Um, and when faith identifies with a political, particular political project, with, with the people and its political uh, project, I think that's where the dangers, dangers come. Uh, I tend to be, I mean, my, my tradition is more of a, of a Protestant one, more of an um, Anabaptist free church uh, tradition. I tend to think of, uh, of separation of, of church and state, religion and, uh, and government as a very important thing. I, in fact, see that inscribed in all the world faiths because they are, as I mentioned earlier, kind of distinct systems, not separate. Right? Separation is, is not, uh, separation properly understood is neutrality of state toward, toward religions. But it doesn't mean lack of engagement with variety, varieties of social issues. So that's more in general terms where I end up. And uh, I think on the whole that's a very good thing. I think faiths are more influential the less entangled they are with, uh, with politics and with power. Uh, I think that's a, that's a mistake that Christian faith has often made, that other faiths have made. And actually, if you study through history, it's the proximity to power that renders faith ineffectual. <laughs> it's the distance from power and critical engagement <clears throat> with it that renders it, it becomes risky, it has no certainties in terms of outcomes, but I think if it's effectual, it will be effectual from a distance, in a sense from a margin. It will be effectual from where it was born, rather from where it sometimes seek to be. Um, we have um, two problems. One is uh, insatiability, because I think everybody wants to ask questions now. Uh, and the other one, of course, is mortality, because we have to stop. <laughs> but I hope that has not made this lecture meaningless, not at all. In fact. America, thank you so much for stimulating us. I think I'm really thank you. 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 Thank I haven't fallen asleep. <laughs> we won't let you. you absolutely. Uh, oh, you want something from me? Yes, I can. Okay, I he's, just take me all the time. <laughs> he's, he's reaching for my pocket. I, I don't understand. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>